Podcast. I'm Kat. And I'm Moose. This is our interview series where we interview people who display the quirks of being human. Hey Kat. Oh hey Moose. What are you doing over there? I'm I'm uh I'm finishing uh Stacy Francis' book. <laughs> well she's here. Well I I know, and she gave me an advanced copy like about a year and a half ago. <laughs> And you know how slow I read. <laughs> so so today was my day of of, uh, of finishing the book. And I'm going to put my little uh, Amazon light right away. I think she caught you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, hi, Stacey. Hi, <laughs> I, I, I didn't finish reading your book today, but somebody I know did, Moose. I crammed it this morning. Um, I had, you know, I had already kind of flipped through the PDF. We got the, we got the fancy early copy of mm-hmm, her book mm-hmm. and cause we're famous. It, well, yeah, yeah, duh. Um, and so I've had it for a minute and I flipped through it and I was like, okay, I have to read this entire thing. So I speed read it for about three and a half hours this morning. I was so impressed because by the time I sent you or resent you the PDF, I was like, here you go. And you're like, yeah, I'm almost done with the book. <laughs> I'm like, how did you do that? I would have had to have seven naps. Not because the book is not amazing, but because we know I cannot read without napping. It doesn't matter what the material is. Should we introduce Stacy? I think we should. So our friend and who we consider a family member and also one of the people that her book is largely about, also a family member. Abby, one of our favorite people in the One of our world. favorite humans. <laughs> um, the mother of that human, also one of our favorite humans, is here with us today. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. I'm not only a guest, I'm a big fan. I really, <laughs> truly. Well, I think you have to be because you're sort of part of the family. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. I will. <laughs> well, we're really glad to have you here and also really glad to be talking about your book that comes out around Mother's Day. Well, first of all, this is a new setup right here for us. Uh, we're in your studio instead yep. of ours. Mm-hmm. And we just kind of have like three chairs gathered around Sarah and her mighty computers. She looks like she's at the um, <laughs> space station. <laughs> and Houston, the we have a problem. <laughs> yeah, we do have a problem. Uh, and so uh, Stacy said this reminded her of uh, the Saturday Night Live skit. <laughs> It Are you talking about the infamous <laughs> sweaty, sweaty balls? balls. <laughs> Nothing like a sweaty ball. <laughs> sweaty balls. Good times. Mm. Good times. Mm. 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 Oh. Mm. Sweaty balls. <laughs> so we figure we would start this one pretty irreverent, as we usually do, to make it <laughs> <What> feel <a> shock. <laughs> <laughs> make it feel like a cat and moose podcast. Well, what I was going to say is that I have been a fan of Stacey Frenes for a really long time. And that is because I first learned about you through your music. And so I would love to hear from you about, you know, just a a brief recap of your wonderful, beautiful life so far, like kind of how your your career started and where it is right now. And I would love for you to include your music because I think your voice is so heavenly. Um, So tell us a little bit about you. Well, thank you. I, so I've just always been a lover of words and music since I was a little girl. So I guess that's kind of the real cell, you know, opening of my story is just, I love words. I love music. I've been, um, I've been someone who's been a writer at heart, you know, since I was a little girl. So, um, my love of words led me to, um, study English actually in college. I was an English major, but I was also a songwriter. I've always loved writing songs. And so just that kind of natural outflow led to, um, just singing in coffee shops, you know, all around during college. And then right after college, I, um, came to Nashville and, um, did a showcase and kind of got a publishing deal and then, but went back home to California because, um, we started, I got married early and we were young, we were just babies, but we, um, thought we might like to start our own kind of indie sort of publishing and record company and management. We just kind of keep it in house. My husband and I, he's like a real maverick extrovert, um, 
eight. I was going to say, I think he's an Enneagram. <laughs> Straight eight. up eight <laughs> to my four. Um, and so we just thought this is, this could be kind of a cool way to just sort of do this together as a couple. And so we started doing that, um, released a few records, indie records, and um, had two kids along the way in our 20s. And um, yeah, I've just always been sort of organically homegrown, stayed home, but also um, made lots of trips to Nashville as a songwriter. And, um, and then about five, six years ago, tried my hand at my first book because I really loved talking about the creative process and what that looks like for different people at different walks of life. And that was your book called Flourish. Flourish. That was Flourish. Um, imagine a four wanting to write about the specifics (laughs) of creativity. I know it's wacky. (laughs) Yeah. So that's, and so then, um, in between flourish and now just life happened and in the course of life happening. So somewhere in our twenties, we we ended up having two kids. We had a son, Zach, and then a daughter, Abby, who you mentioned earlier. And at that point we, we figured we were done because we had had kids from A to Z. (laughs) (laughs) And so being a mom became part of my really identity. I mean, a big part of my identity. And, um, so around the teenage years, I, I kept making music, kept traveling, kept uh, making indie records. And then, um, yeah, so when Abby was about 16 is when she came out to us um, and told us she was gay. And then I feel like that's where sort of the trajectory of a different part of my journey started in some ways, um, just spiritually and as a mom. And um, so it has been actually almost, you know, 10 years since that happened. And so, but about five years ago is when I started writing the book that, that you were, um, that you're still getting through cat. <laughs> <laughs> I have finished it as of like three minutes awesome. ago. Oh, and when I was talking, <laughs> when you were talking, I'm like, Ooh, okay. That punchline was a good one. I, I was listening. To okay. You. Thank you. <laughs> the, the book that she is referring to is love makes room and other things I learned when my daughter came out. And again, we are talking on the Cat and Moose podcast with Stacey Prentice. And the foreword is by Sarah Cunningham, who we've also interviewed in love. Uh huh. Love that. Love it. Um, so I think it's important that timeline that you shared because you and I were talking before we got on mic, and um, I was telling you how much I enjoyed the book that I crashed and read this morning. Um, and, uh, you know, you said something really interesting that um, it's somewhat hard for you to look back and recognize some of the feelings you had because that was 10 years ago. It really was. And, and, you know, as hopefully we'll talk and, and I'll say more a little bit about, but it's weird going back to revisit and really inhabit a headspace that you were in 10 years ago, mm-hmm. um, for about anything, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. um, this, this topic in particular is, is one that I just feel like I've done so much work and growth on that, that to come back to it, um, is challenging, but but this is my first time really officially talking about it in, in this kind of setting. So, um, and I'm among friends, so I feel like, okay, well, it'll be fine. Absolutely. Know? Yeah. Among friends and family. And and I just want to say for someone doing their first interview about their second book, you're really well-spoken. Oh, I mean, clearly you have studied the language for a really long time, as is evidenced in your book. One of the things that I noticed in your book is that your writing really, really draws the reader in. Like I felt like when you and Abby were sitting in that car Mm. and you just knew, okay, I'm not going to not talk about whatever is going on, the movement of the windshield wipers, the rain that was coming down. It's like I was there in that moment with you. And I just want to really commend that, yes, the subject matter of this book is amazing. The person about whom you're writing in a lot of ways, Abby, is amazing. And like we said, one of our favorite humans. And you are amazing, too. Your writing is really, really exceptional. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, very easy to read and, and really, really drew me in right before I fell asleep every time. (laughs) (laughs) Drew you in and lulled you to sleep. (laughs) You were my lullaby for the past year. It was amazing. (laughs) Could you just sing to me a little? (laughs) Yeah. Could it come with like an audio clip where you just sing cat to sleep? That would be great. Amazing. Um, I wanted to ask you about that, um, that specific scene in the book. And, you know, I don't want to give away too many pieces of the book, but this was the moment where you could feel that Abby 
was um, her energy was different and something was wrong. There's a sadness there. I wonder if you could just like share how much you're willing to share about that, that moment. Sure. Um, Abby had been, this is her junior year in high school and she to really even understand the gravity of that, that moment and that scene is to know Abby's personality. It's very effervescent and very outgoing and very talkative. And this is a child who, you know, at 18 months old was just talking a blue streak and full sentences already. And, um, she was the kid that when you pick her up from school, you wouldn't even have to say, how was your day? She'd like launch into her day, you know, <laughs> yeah. and tell you all about all the things, everything that she felt and thought and, um, so there came a time around her junior year that all of that just kind of stopped. She stopped talking to me. She, st- she would go up to her room and, and just kind of hide out for, for the rest of the night. She would, didn't want to come down for dinner. Her grades started dropping. Um, she started getting kind of bristly about being asked where she was going and what she was doing. And so there were just all these kind of just signs that you could kind of, as a parent, you sort of chalk it up to, this is sort of teenagerism, you know, they're just Mm -hmm. being teenagers. And I did for a while, but, um, there was this morning kind of in the middle of all of that, where we, we were going, we were heading to school and she just started sobbing in the car. And, um, and I had no idea what was wrong. And how in the world do you say the artist's name who you were listening to? I I need to know. And I'm a music industry professional. Bon Iver. Yep. Is it Bon Iver? Mm Mm-hmm. Because bon I've Iver. heard people say Bon Iver. I've heard Bon Iver. I've well, heard I don't bon think we Iver. have to roll. Well, bon I've, heard Iver. Bon, I've heard Bon Iver and Bon Iver. Okay. I, don't, uh, again, I just wanted to clear things again, up. Again, she set the scene with that song because I knew that exact song. Yeah. You did? Yeah. 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 Abby put it on the Skinny Love. Yes. Love that song. So she put that song on. She was crying. Um, it was just this whole kind of like... You know, scene where I didn't know how much to to ask because it seemed like every little hint I threw at her, like, are you okay? You know, no. And she'd turn away and look, not look at me. And, um, you know, it, we got closer and closer to school and she just was sobbing. And so finally I said, well, I'm not taking you to school like this. So we pulled over and um, it's pouring down rain. And, uh, and I just kind of went through this whole litany of questions, like awful questions that mothers don't want to ask their kids, you know, right. like what's happening? Are you, is someone hurting you? It, 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 you know, is there something wrong at school? Has someone done something and all of the, you know, and then, and then it, you know, kind of got to the mother of all questions, which I, I really was thinking was the thing, which is, I said, are you pregnant? You know, and I was, yeah, could course. barely even say the word, you know? And then she said no. And so all these, all these things. And then, um, and I remember her just saying at one point, well, for starters, my heart is broken. And then she started crying harder. And then I was like, oh, so that's it. You just, some boy broke her heart and (laughs) um, we can get through this. It's all good. You know? Totally. So I, I kind of breathed a sigh of relief and started going, oh, okay. Is it someone I know? Is it a boy you've been seeing for a while? And then, and then, you know, more crying and more doubling (laughs) over. And it was just like, I was like, how are we going to get to the bottom of this? And so I, you know, and I just remember going, she, at some point she said, if I tell you, if I tell you what's wrong, I have to tell you everything. Mm. Hmm. And, and that's when I, I knew there was something deeper and just, there was something more. And, um, in, in the course of about an hour, we finally kind of got down to finally uh, me saying to her, is this about a girl? Are you, is that why your heart's broken? And, and then she nodded and said, she didn't not, she didn't say yes. She just nodded. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I said, are you, are you telling me that, that you're gay? And then she again, nod and crying, more crying. And then we both just kind of sat in the car with it for, I don't even know how long it could have been three hours. It could have been three minutes. It Mm -hmm. just felt like this, like time stood still. And, um, and it was, uh, and I knew, you know, and I even I had the knowing in that moment that she had just risked everything by telling me that, you Mm -hmm. know? And, um, yeah. Wow. I, I really, um, one of the things that you said in the book, and I'm, I'm not going to quote you verbatim so you can correct me, but I remember how I felt when I read it, um, was something along the lines of, of she deserved your absolute, um, understanding and attention and love and unconditional love. Like, like I loved how 
in that moment, you articulated for those of us reading that that because she had risked everything, like because she had told you what to her was her deepest apparently darkest at the time because she had kind of gone into herself. Her grades had fallen. You know, she had gotten very sullen and quiet and all those things that we know Abby is not typically. (laughs) It's like, it's like you responded by, by basically saying like, I'm going to give this everything. Yeah. it, It almost felt like there was this kind of unwritten code between us where we had, we had faced things before with such honesty. And this, you know, this was a girl who just bared her heart all the time, you know, and just her level of vulnerability with me t- just called me out and, and said, you know, just called me out to be a better mom. And, and, um, and, you know, it, it was one of those things where like, I, you wished you could kind of go back and go back in time and kind of go, this is one of those things where I can't unsee, I can't unhear that. I can't. And you, you realize you have to deal with the information that's in front of you. You have to. And, and you have all these choices in that moment as a parent of how to go and how to be. And I, I just felt like her level of vulnerability required the same of me, you know, that's so honoring. I love how honoring that is of your daughter and how beautiful it is describing the, the both of your relationship with one another. And I just have a question. Come on. (laughs) What does Abby think now that the book is out? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, she's been incredibly supportive from the very beginning. And then, um, as it got closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, um, she's been still supportive, but also, very clear that she's her own person and has her own story. And that's been a part of our conversation all along is that, you know, this is, this is my telling of a story that is largely hers. Mm. And, um, I want to be really clear on that. And, and I think that when, when, and if she ever wants to tell her own version of things, she most certainly will. And we know she's very capable of, Mm -hmm. of, um, communicating. Um, but yeah, that it's, like at first it was really smooth sailing and then it it got a little bit bumpy and a little bit tricky as we negotiated these kind of conversations where, um, you know, and I think initially I had visions of like us kind of being like, the Judds, you know, <laughs> talking about this. <laughs> you know? I love the I know, Judds. I love, Tell I me about the good old days. Uh, right? Grandma. Like, you know, like, or grandpa. <laughs> grandpa. <laughs> or grandma. Or grandma. I mean, they're probably both there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it became clear really early on that she, she wasn't really interested in like, you know, being a dog and pony show and telling this story together because she's on her own journey and she's on her own path toward finding out just who she is as an adult. And, um, and I, I, one of the lessons I talk about in the book about what to make room for in this world, in this kind of growing season of my life was to make room for her story to be her story Mm -hmm. and my story to be my story. Um, I heard one time I heard a, um, her name's Danny Shapiro. She's a memoir writer. I she's love a, Danny oh, Shapiro. She's amazing. Oh my god. She's like the queen of memoir. I, and we were talking about um, On Being, the podcast. That's yes. where I first learned of her. Oh my gosh, yeah. So she's like the queen of memoir. I learned a lot from her when I wrote the book. But she she talks about how sometimes memoir writing is like feeling like you're standing outside of a closed door and you're just hearing conversations inside. And all you can do is bear witness to what you're hearing outside the door. You mm-hmm. can't some, some rooms you can't be in and I can't, I can't be in Abby's room, right. but I can speak to what it feels like to be Abby's mom mm-hmm. and to be, and to have my own experience around the events that, that occurred. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's a really clear distinction, you know, because Abby is her very own person. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and I, sure. I don't know many people who really, embody being their own snowman like abby frenis no she She, listen look (laughs) everyone just pay attention and here's the thing is like abby may roll her eyes and be like "Mm, i don't know moose that well but i have been around abby plenty enough times (laughs) to go that girl is wild and free yes and in the most like responsible way you know what i'm saying like well, but, most of the time. Well, I was going to say, and then there's times <laughs> where she's like, screw that. That doesn't work for me anymore. And I really respect that in a lot of ways. There's a line in the book that I, I wrote that, that, uh, 
it took me forever to write the line, but, and I cried a hundred times writing it, but it was, you know, when I'm able to set aside my misgivings about the choices that my daughter makes, I can, I can see and, and allow her to become fully who she's supposed to be. I can see that my daughter has been teaching me how to be brave all her life. Yeah. Are you kidding me? That gave me chills. And it's so true. This is a child who from the very beginning said, this is who I am and I'm not ashamed of it. Mm -hmm. And I will be fully who I am. And part of our, our, our tension in which I talk about in the book is that she was ready to just be fully out a hundred percent right away, right away. And you have to understand that, that maybe which, you know, you guys know, but maybe not everybody knows is that we're talking about a family that was Jesus loving, evangelical church going. We're talking about mom and dad are worship leaders, very, very entrenched in, in um, conservative Christian upbringing. And that's how my kids were raised. That's how I was raised. So it's not like she learned this freedom and <laughs> out, good point. You know what I mean? <laughs> from yeah. us or from in our house. It's like she just knew that that's who she needed to be. And so part of my story has was always like, well, how much am I going to tell of this story and how much am I going to reveal and how much how much of it is mine to even tell? Also, this is going to be weird to the circles that I move mm-hmm. in um as I'm sort of growing in this area and learning and discovering what this is all about there aren't really a lot of safe people I can even talk to in Mm -hmm. my world. And that was part of what I learned, you know? And do you know what I find really fascinating about that is that when, when I think of scriptures, when I think of Jesus, I think of things like freedom, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think of things like, okay, isn't that what God wants for us? Doesn't God want us to be that free child that, that absolutely like living life with absolute reckless abandon, like, isn't that what God wants for us? And when we describe Christian culture, we describe it as something that doesn't offer that. Mm. And I feel like as, as a, a community of believing people, like that's something to really look at, you know, it's like, wow, what you are saying is the thing that will save your soul for eternity, like embody that for real, Mm -hmm. you know? And I really think it's beautiful that, that despite um, what culture um, has taught us and what we've, a lot of us have grown up in that Abby just completely burst out of that. And, and to me, that to me feels like the most authentic version of our faith. Mm -hmm. So can you back up a little bit and, um, and talk about, um, did Abby go to school that day? I forget. (laughs) Good, really good point. Uh, she, no, we ended up turning around and going home and, um, and she went back up to her room and just kind of, I think she was so wiped out from the big reveal right. and I was wiped out and we both just kind of went our separate ways for a little while that day in the house. And then kind of what followed was a season of just sort of us going, well, so now what? And what does this mean? And cause I, as I was saying the the roots that we were really entangled in, had had nowhere to to put this information mm-hmm. and there was nowhere to just kind of like process it. I there was literally not a single person I could call on the phone that day and say you know, well there was there, I, I finally I mean I called my sister and I called there was two other friends that I could call that 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 I knew um yeah, but all that to say there there weren't it's weird because getting back to your point about church culture, I thought about all the different times in my life that I could rally around my church friends and go, man, I think I need prayer around this. I just need, you know, someone to walk through this with me and and talk about it with me. But for that, for that specific incident, there, there was no common ground with my Christian friends. Like I didn't know a single friend that had gone through that. Were you um, uh, afraid to reveal it or was it just too fresh that you hadn't processed like what you were feeling yourself about it? At first it was the freshness and I had, I hadn't processed it. And then as kind of life went on and I got used to the idea, um, it was more about just, uh, 
the the places that I stood on stage and the things that uh, the people that I networked with and my actual life's work and vocation, which involved a lot of just being in front of evangelical churches singing or speaking, um, I I didn't it didn't feel like a safe place to talk about this because I knew what church doctrine said about this. Mm -hmm. And I also knew that I, I was, that, that the more I learned and the more I researched and studied and prayed, the more I was not aligning with most of that. Yeah. You know, um, I want, I asked you if you'd be willing to read this. Um, and I just want to emphasize this isn't where you are now. Um, but I, I just want you to, uh, share these questions that you wrote in your book, because I thought this was really interesting. And I think where a lot of, um, I wouldn't even say just Christian, but people who um, aren't expecting for their child to come out, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of the same thoughts. And I thought it was just really revealing. Yeah. And I, I wrote these questions one day when we were moving, it, it was very soon after Abby had told me she was coming out and, and she had come out and um, we were moving and the movers had left one box in my garage and it was my wedding dress that I had packed up and in my mind had saved for Abby one day and something about just seeing it and putting that together with the news she had just told me something about it just felt crushing. And so I was so afraid because I didn't know what was in Abby's future at that point. So I was just sobbing in the garage, looking at that dumb wedding dress. And I, I was asking the questions, uh, where would she end up? What kind of life would she have? Who would take care of her? Would she ever have children? Would God, could God forgive her? What would we tell our church? Why did my friends get to have daughters who'd get married and have babies and normal lives? Why did I have to be the one to have a gay daughter? And what is that like for you to read those things now, like 10 years post? I feel like I'm betraying my daughter by even saying those questions out loud a little bit. I, I don't at all feel the same way. I can see... I understand what those fears were coming from. They were coming from a really um, very a narrow uh, perspective on uh, what it meant to be who she is. And um, so it feels like a different person wrote those questions than, than the person I am today. I don't have those same fears for Abby's life. I don't have those same fears about her future, um, whether it's eternal or whether it's just the years she has on this earth. It's like, I don't, yeah, I don't have that same perspective now. Isn't it interesting how life just evolves like that? Like I was just telling someone the other day, actually in one of my classes, I said, if you would have told me two years ago that I would be sitting here at 10 o'clock at night in massage school, <laughs> I, I, I would have like, I would have been like, you got the wrong girl. You, th This is not me. Like you don't know me or my God or anything about anything mm. about me, you know? And it's just so interesting how life and its events unfold in such a way that I personally think evolve us into so much more of compassionate people. And I also think like one of the things that, that I noticed as I read your book over the past year, um, is that you really developed a compassion for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that self-compassion and, and I, I quote my therapist in this all the time, self-compassion is a prerequisite for healing. Mm -hmm. And I think having compassion for ourselves and obviously, yes, for the people around us, it's a lot easier to have compassion for people around us than it is ourselves. Um, but you talk about mom guilt, you talk about shame, you talk about what do people think, like, like all of that kind of stuff. And, and to just see you 10 years later and, and for us both having known you that whole time, it's been really cool to see how much your compassion has has spread not only to your family and all the people around you and all that, but but just how it seems like that's evolved and how you treat yourself. And I think that's really important. Thank you. I, one of the things that happened um, around around five years ago, it took, the impetus of the book for me was a blog post I wrote that was the first time I took a baby step toward talking about it in public. And it was, it was a blog that I wrote that just said, uh, what I learned about love when mm -hmm. my daughter came out. Mm -hmm. And I remember the I haters. Yeah, I, I remember the haters. I, oh, I remember man. being like, Oh my gosh. I remember seeing it on Facebook and I think I text cat right away. And I was like, this is huge mm -hmm. because I knew it wasn't just huge for you and your sort of understanding of your 
you know, how your family has changed. But I, it meant to me that someone, I mean, you're well known in the Christian industry. She's um, famous. What? She's famous. She is kind of famous, <laughs> but it's like you, you're very well connected. And I knew for you to put that out there that that could change things for you. Yeah. And it, it did. It definitely did. Um, I, I started getting a series of what I call uninvitations for the, the next few years. I was um, getting fired up reading that part. Oh, I, man. I was like cursing, sitting on my couch going like, of course this happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, um, I was going to say that it, one of the things that it brought out of sort of out of the woodwork was other, especially other um, sort of Christian people in Christian leadership, like pastors I'd known for years or worship leaders or other artists that started just DMing me, you know, messaging me after reading this post and going, I can't believe you're talking about this. Our daughter or our niece mm -hmm. or our granddaughter or our child, like, and we can't talk about it right. or our jobs are in danger. Right. And, um, it, it got to be this really real, like, um, thing, you know, where I realized, oh, like by talking about it, I'm actually just, I'm, I'm giving other people maybe some permission to mm -hmm. talk about it too. Mm -hmm. And that, that became why I started writing the book is mm -hmm. just, okay, I need to be honest about this whole process. And, and the other reason I wrote it is because um, I think, you know, there's sort of two camps. There's people that go, why do you even need to write a book about this? Well, shouldn't it just be a hundred percent okay that your daughter comes out as right. gay? And like, why is this even an issue? Sure. How can you fill, you know, mm -hmm. 240 pages of what's the deal? And then you have other people kind of saying, um, well, there's nothing more. To be, this is an open shut case. This is just, it is what it is. And this is what God says was the Bible says, and what's there to talk about. But I think there's this whole, in fact, Krista Tippett talks about this whole kind of like middle, um, uh, where most of the people are, where most people are, are having those questions and wrestling with those mm -hmm. things and just not in public and they're right. not talking about it. And I think that, you know, in church choirs and in church pews and in Bible studies and all these places, absolutely people are, are, are wrestling with this topic. Mm -hmm. They're just, there isn't a lot of permission to talk about it yet. And, um, and I think I wanted to be really true to uh, how how messy the process was for me, but also how necessary mm -hmm. um, it is for all of us to yeah. try to move toward this place of inclusion and mm -hmm. love and tolerance and acceptance. Um, but because I think of the number of families that I saw hurting that just came out uh, in these after the that blog went kind of viral because the Huffington Post picked it up and it just went you know, just tons mm -hmm. of people read it. And I got so many messages from people just living in their own kind of closets. Mm -hmm. You know, Sarah yeah. Cunningham talks about how the child comes out first and the parent comes out of the closet. Mm -hmm. And it's hard as yeah. that, especially if you've been really in this very um, prescribed, what I would say is, is a narrow um, understanding of this topic. Mm -hmm. It's hard to talk about it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that I really love that my therapist says on a regular basis is she says, Kat, I want you to know that there is space here for that. There is space here for whatever it is that I've just brought up is if it's something that I feel shame about or something that I feel angry about. And she'll, she'll even say like, I can hold space for you and for that feeling. And, um, and I've thought about that almost every time she says it, I've thought about your book and your book's title and the titles of each of the chapters. You talk about making room amidst something, or you talk about making room for something amidst a circumstance. And obviously that's a theme. It's the title of the book. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I, I think that, um, for me, the process really did involve, uh, in my head, I looked at it almost as like, um, it didn't happen in one big aha moment that I was, I suddenly woke up one day and was like, I'm so okay with all of this all of a sudden. What happened? Why doesn't it work that way? <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so it happened by degrees and I, I began to picture it as like, you know how the little tributaries run down from mm. mountains and then they, they form bigger streams and those streams join rivers and then the river reaches the ocean. It's like, first, I think the disruption was the 
Abby coming out and I could feel my heart kind of break open. And then, but I, I also knew that I was within this framework, this system that I'd been raised in and taught, you know, a way of believing and thinking about these things that, that just felt like there's no room in here mm -hmm. for this. Mm -hmm. And yet here was my beautiful daughter saying these things and being this real person. How could I possibly not fit her into this thing that and so I, it was like, something's got to give either this tiny framework has to give or my beautiful daughter, you know, somehow in this world can't flourish and be the person she's supposed to be. Well, of course I'm going to choose mm -hmm. the flourishing of my own daughter. And so I had to work on this, uh, the tiny little kind of, what am I going to do with all this? And so I realized, well, there has to just be room made for things. There has to be room made for conversations around this topic. There has to be room made for maybe new friends and a new community. Mm -hmm. There has to be room made for um, humor and be, and feeling <laughs> stupid and awkward about things. Like we still don't understand really a lot of the lingo uh -huh. and Abby's still teaching us how to talk. Oh my because... gosh. My, my absolute favorite part of the book. I, I have to read it. I wrote it down because I just got the giggle so bad. It was where you guys uh, were talking about how you and Abe, your husband, were talking about LGBTQ yes. and how in your family it's just BLT. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> because Abe is like he could not get the letters right. And right. Let's face it, it's kind of a mouthful. It is and mouthful. It's like bleh, bleh, bleh. and so it just got BLTs. Abe calls them the BLTs. <laughs> hey, right on. Who you doesn't know? love a BLT? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Even vegans like BLTs. <laughs> yeah. So room, you know, room to laugh about it at time when the, when we didn't understand things. I mean, I can remember Abby and I. And we still have conversations like this, but there, I remember conversations where I would just ask her, "Okay, explain to me." why it is that, you know, it, some things are this way and some things are that way. And, and she would just kind of laugh and like, <laughs> you know, like, like a, 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 an adult laughs at a child who's being really <laughs> silly, like, Oh mom, you know, <laughs> but it's like, I, I value those conversations and I, and I value the conversations with her friends and her community that just kept stretching my heart mm -hmm. open, all of those things. Um, and then I think the biggest thing was the theological part of it, you mm -hmm. know, understanding like, okay, maybe I, maybe there is another way to, um, believe, to, to approach scripture, to, um, understand this topic that is different from the one I was brought up with, you know, that took longer, but mm -hmm. it, it was part of the process that I think like made room and, um, Michael B. Curry, the guy that, um, he just wrote a book called love is the way okay. I think it's called. But anyway, he says, you know, when Jesus talks about in my father's house are many mansions, he said, it says, it's as though as Jesus is trying to describe the kingdom, he's trying to think of the most expansive metaphor possible. Hmm. Like it's so big that there's all these mansions for everyone. And that was part of kind of the metaphor I was going with when I was writing the book and really going through this process is like, this is about me growing and stretching. It's not about her changing anything, mm -hmm. you know? So I love that. I mean, I, I love how you talk about like needing to find a new community um, and a community that was willing to have those conversations with you. Um, I heard recently this phrase, it's probably a really common phrase, but it just hit me upside the head of, um, you know, we're, we're, we're as sick as our deepest secrets. Mm. And it's funny because, uh, my initial thought when I heard that was, oh, what do I have shame about? You know? And then I started thinking about, and you know, yes, there's an individual piece to that, but then I started thinking about, Okay. Instead of we are only as sick as our d deepest secrets, it, um, so is the church. Yeah. And I know so many people, and you know that that are Christians who have children who I can think of two right now: one who has um, a gay daughter, and and one who has a trans son, and um, they they show up at these, you know, events or these concerts or whatever it is they have to represent. And they, they leave a piece of themselves behind because that's not something they can bring to church or to work or whatever that is. And so this book is so meaningful, Stacey, because I, I feel like, um, you know, I, I feel like so many parents need to read this and 
even if their child isn't gay, if their child is straight as straight gets to recognize like, okay, this world that we live in um, from a Christian's, you know, viewpoint, I I might have to look at this a little bit differently. And so I'm just curious if you would like, I know you talked about like scriptures and things like that. Um, Is there anything that as you were kind of studying that was this huge aha, whether that was just a revelation on your own or, you know, was there a specific thing that made you go like, okay, I need to break the stuff open even more. There were a few things like that. Um, and one of them is really, really detailed. And there are other very much more scholarly, smart scripture people that could do it better than me, but I, I will, I'll, I'll hint at it and let people go kind of dig if they want to, and we can maybe put some, um, resources Mm -hmm. in, um, would love that. Yeah. The things that I found super helpful, but one of them was language. I mean, I started this conversation by talking about what a word nerd I'm, I've (laughs) always loved language Mm -hmm. and, and so much hinged for me on the word homosexual in the Bible. And so I thought maybe that's a place to start, Mm -hmm. you know? And, um, so I did, I went after just, you know, doing a whole study of that word, how, how it was used, how long it's been in, in use and, and just, you know, a very cursory research will turn up the fact that 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 word is fairly new to our uh, biblical lexicon, that it mm-hmm. only really entered Bibles at, at around um, the mid 1940s. And that and that from that point on, it was it was um, it was made to I mean, I had always believed that that word meant not only the definition of someone's sexual orientation, but also the behavior itself. And so it was always this kind of like, well, anyone who is a homosexual is, is sort of, you know, looped into this category. And that was the first thing that for me was like this huge red flag. Cause, cause anytime you see it, it's on this, it's like a list of vices in the new <laughs> Testament. And I'm like, I would look at these vices and go like kidnapping, idolaters, <laughs> thieves, murderers, homosexuals. And I'd be like, so my daughter who loves puppies and wouldn't hurt a spider <laughs> and who prays at night that Jesus would help her with this or that. Really good. That's where she belongs on that list. Like things were just not squaring. Because away, of know? who she naturally loves, you know? Yes, yeah. exactly. So things were just not squaring up with that word. That word was problematic for me. So I went after it. I studied it. And a lot came up that I realized had been really, really poorly translated into English. And, um, I think it has been, it, it, it has hurt. I mean, there's, there's movies out that are being made mm-hmm. right now about it, how it has damaged LGBTQ people for decades, mm-hmm. the use of that word. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So that was one of the first things. And then, and then I just backed up really. And the, and kind of one of the biggest things was just the entire arc of scripture being, being one of God pursuing his people with love. And, um, and then Jesus in the gospels, who was constantly breaking the law basically and saying, you know, you've heard it said this, but I tell you, Mm. and it was kind of this whole idea that, wow, maybe, maybe we've gotten it wrong in this topic. Maybe we've hung up on laws and rules and what Jesus has been saying all along is that it's not about that and that it's really about what you started with, which is the, the, the absolute heart of God that wants every human being to flourish and develop into the fullness of who they're supposed to be. Um, and, and really it was almost as though my gut, my mother's intuition that always knew that Abby was good, exactly how Mm -hmm, she was. mm -hmm. It was like, that was ahead of my theology. Mm. My theology had to catch up with that sense of inner, like, yeah, that's right. One of the things that I've been learning in, in my studies has been that, um, our bodies, um, have so much wisdom, like they just contain so much wisdom. And I think that that's actually like a primal characteristic of us. Um, because, you know, way back in the day, back in like Neanderthal days and stuff like that, it's like our inherent, um, intuition and our physical response to things was to stay alive. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and now, you know, being in a a first world Western society, it's like staying alive. Like, ah, I don't even have to worry about that. I've got a roof over my head and I've got three meals a day and, and all of that. And, and one of the things that, that it makes me, it makes me think of is that 
over the years and over time and through our modern experiences, and I know technology has a lot to do with this, we day after day after day, like we lose the ability to pay attention to those instincts, to pay attention to those things that are deep in our soul. And the fact that like there were multiple times in the book where you brought up that as a mother, With a mother's instinct, you knew that you knew that you knew. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that that's at the root of what each one of us, even if if this is a topic that no one in your life has touched that you know of, and it, it, it doesn't matter. Like your book, although it is about, you know, it's subtitled and other things I learned when my daughter came out, I really feel like there's a part of me that wants to extrapolate all the parts in this book about Abby being gay and just go this is a freaking great book about parenting mm. it's a great or book about, about jesus about jesus love jesus's yeah. love and about listening to your instincts and, and all of that so I, I would love for you to talk about how that mother's instinct kind of broke through some of maybe the biggest barriers that you had wow that's a great question i i can remember one time i um and I, there's a chapter about this in the book where I decided at, for high, um, Abby's high school graduation, I decided to make this slideshow for her. Remember when that was the big deal mm-hmm. of like showing all the slides. <laughs> and I just went through these, I took a day to go through photo albums and um, look at all these different pictures of Abby. And it was when I was still kind of in this really liminal space of like not knowing where I was landing on all these things. And I didn't, you know, I was very, I, it was a very real fear of like her eternal soul and these <laughs> kinds of questions that you just wrestle with that night. And at the same time, I was like, you know, but she's my daughter, so I'm gonna do this thing. And so I started looking at these photographs of her from age, you know, three on up to, to, um, 18. And as I saw in like photo after photo in like bad Halloween costumes and haircuts (laughs) and teeth missing and all the things that the children go through, I saw, you know, her essence in every photograph, like as only a mother can. Mm. And I've always thought, you know, there's mothers have this superpower of being able to look at their child at any age and see their absolute essence, Mm. you know, no matter how old you are. Mm -hmm. And, um, I saw that in every photograph and something was so, it was so healing for me to look through all these iterations of Abby. And, you know, Abby was one of these kids who went through lots of <laughs> phases. <laughs> I think she's still going through them. Say, <laughs> Heck yeah. You know. last, last I heard, she's become a hiker. What? She's a total <laughs> hiker. Oh, my favorite about when you, she posted that and you said, wow, you're really outdoorsy. <laughs> <laughs> I was as shocked as you were. <laughs> Yeah. So all these, you know, like the goth phase and the punker phase and the skater phase or all these different, I was like, oh no, there's still Abby. I see her. I see that smile. I see that little mischievous Mm -hmm. look. I see that. And, and by the end of that project, I had this slideshow, but really, and I thought I was going to do this. It was this big gift for her, (laughs) but really the whole event, the, the whole project was a gift to me to be able to see again at that mother gut level this is my child. Mm -hmm. Nothing fundamental has changed about her since telling me that she's gay. She's still the same. It's the same heart that beat against mine when she was a baby girl, Mm. when she was five years old and she came running to me when she was 10 years old. And now at 17, as I'm hugging her and she's graduating college, it's the same child. Mm -hmm. And for any parent that ever doubts that about their gay or trans or whatever child, like, no, Mm -hmm. no, it, this really, really, really is your child. Don't listen to any other voices that tell you differently. This is that child you love. So I remember that being a really pivotal time for me. Mm -hmm. And I remember too, just like realizing, okay, you know, life, this moment is like a snapshot. It is like a Polaroid snapshot and it's still developing. It's still going to become what it's going to become. She's still becoming who she's going to become. And like, like I could see along this whole line of photos I had chosen, she was still growing and becoming and morphing and, you know, changing and, um, and all of that to say, I, I was able to fully see her and embrace her Mm. for the fullness of just happiness, you know, Mm -hmm. that she's always had. (laughs) (laughs) I want to hear the story about Abby dragging you to a gay bar. Oh, this is (laughs) (laughs) because I have to think that from the time she told you to that point, 
like you you know no matter what you're still like okay that's your life but mm-hmm. at some point you go you know what yes i want to i want to see this <laughs> i want to understand <laughs> i did and it was it was definitely that and and she had been telling me about this this place where she went and did open mic night and it was you know uh, it just, it happened to be, you know, a lesbian bar. And I, it was just one of those things where it's like, I'd never, ever darkened the doorway of, of a place like that ever <laughs> in my life. <laughs> and so, um, I told her I'd go. And I, I remember just like walking in and feeling so self-conscious. Like I know everything about my clothes and my demeanor and everything <laughs> just screamed like heterosexual mom coming through. <laughs> oh, that's so good. <laughs> so fantastic. Oh, there's one of the hetero moms here to see her daughter. <laughs> Christian here mom to, coming through. <laughs> here to check out the scene. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Might be witnessing to us later. <laughs> and so I sat down at a table. She was on stage and she, as usual, killed it. Sounded amazing. Sang something. And I was so proud of her. But what was beautiful to me was just... I, you know, I went in just with like a lot of reservations and just thinking, oh, this is going to be freaky and I'm, it's going to be weird. And, you know, and just listening to the conversations among these, they're all probably early 20 something young women talking about their lives, talking about um, their jobs, their school, their parents, their this or that. I mean, it was the most absolute normal conversation ever. <laughs> it could have been any group of young 20 somethings. And, and it was, um, for me, it was, it was a pivotal, again, it was one of those seminal moments where it was like, okay, I've had so many fears and weird hangups about the gay community. Mm-hmm. I'm, and I'm using big old air quotes here because <laughs> that was part of my upbringing was that that's a dangerous, seedy, weird kind of, they're going to suck they're you gonna in. They're going to suck you in. You'll be gay before you leave. <laughs> <laughs> They'll have you drink a special potion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Or I think as a mom, my fear was just like Abby was going to get taken advantage of. She was going to get brainwashed. She was going to get pulled into things that she didn't want to be a part of. And then it was so preposterous. Like sitting there, I realized how ridiculous my fears were. Mm -hmm. These are just normal people Mm -hmm. living their lives, trying to get through their day. And I thought, you know, I wished all of my Christian friends could just sit there with me and hear it and see it and be a part of it and talk with these kids. And yeah, it was just mind blowing. Well, and to realize that, that whatever it is, that is your thing, you know, whether you're a carpenter, whether you're a gay person, whether you're Episcopal or whether you're, did you you use carpenter for Jesus? I did. (laughs) Okay. Um, agnostic, you know, it's like, that doesn't change the fact that like who you are as a person is just a person, you know? And I think we have these kind of grandiose outlandish ideas of like, well, the gays, they do, you know, (laughs) they're out gallivanting around the city at night. You know, it's like, okay, they're people, (laughs) you know? And even so like the Christians, the Christians are just sitting around in small group all night it's like no they're going to walmart and like buying like oil for their car you know i mean it's like it's not it's not this weird thing that that in our minds we've painted it to be yeah but i think there's a strong labels are strong yes, they can have really strong yeah. holds on us especially yeah. if we buy into those things at, right. at all our lives which right. i sort of did until yeah. i mean i didn't have a lot of gay friends growing up uh, like i said I, I grew up very christian and you know good girl bible college and so um it was yeah it, i needed to really unlearn mm-hmm. a lot of those kind of labels mm-hmm. and yeah so, uh, out of curiosity, what have you learned about yourself in this process? So much. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to also ask, has it changed your songwriting? Oh yeah, it really has. It's changed my songwriting a lot. I've, I, I can hardly write. Well, I mean, if I'm being really honest and I might as well just be honest because probably your listeners aren't necessarily the people that are like the gatekeepers at evangelical churches anyway, right? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but, and it used to be that I cared about what those people thought about my beliefs. And, but um, I guess my point is, I don't, I don't know that I can write any more things that will get me into those doors anymore. 
And, and I don't mean that to say that I stopped believing in God or that I, any of that, but it's the things that I'm finding important and want to talk about are just more, a little broader. And, um, it, so I think that my, my perspective has just sort of blown up and, and because of that, um, I'm reading books like Holy Envy by Barbara Brown Taylor and yeah. talking about how are other faiths teaching, you know, informing mm-hmm. our faith. And, mm-hmm. um, so I haven't thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Sure. Um, I, I'd like to hope that I've saved the absolute precious baby and, you know, um, and I'm trying to get rid of the bathwater, honestly, mm. the things that don't serve anymore, you know? Well, and I've said for forever and ever how I, I want to have, and a friend of ours sent us a, a YouTube link that was the closest thing I've seen to this, but how I want to have a Bible that is just the words of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Like literally just the words of Jesus. I think it's called the Red Letter Bible. Which I bought the domain name and held it for years. And now it's out there floating around for five ninety nine on the internet. Well, but listen, that's what it's like Tesla stock. You don't get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I don't know what I was thinking. All of that to say is that I feel like if you if you kind of pare down and look at like just what Jesus talked about. That's exactly what you're describing. Mm. He didn't sit around and talk about like the the little teeny tiny ins and outs of our day in and day out lives. It's like he talked about very broad topics about how loving is important and, you know, taking care of the widows and the orphans and believing in miracles and, and all of that kind of stuff. And it's like, why in the world do we make such a simple message so complex? Like, why is that important to us? I think one of the bigger issues and I'm this, I just thought of it. So this may not be relevant, but I feel like somewhere along the way in the Christian church, we decided that we would allow someone else to tell us what the scriptures say, Mm -hmm. someone else to interpret the Holy Spirit, who, by the way, has a feminine side, (laughs) you know, like I think the the Holy Spirit like woos us, you know, yeah, she is. She's the nine armed princess, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but, and also God forbid you look into other religions and say, oh, I, I just want to learn about this or that. I remember, uh, I've, I've shared this before, but posting a Deepak Chopra uh, quote and having someone in the Christian, uh, at a radio station say to me that I was wooing people away to Hinduism. And I thought, I wrote back, I wish I had that kind of power. Right. I was just watching Oprah. <laughs> thought it was a good quote. You know, and that's I, fantastic. that stuff used to like really weigh on me. Like, oh my gosh, yeah. that, that person in Indiana yes. cares yes. about. <laughs> and then I was like, I, I guess I'll take it down. And I remember as I was taking it down, that feeling in my spirit of like, that, this is an inspiring quote. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think we we've be I think along the way we've become like oh you're the pastor let me believe what you say is true and you, we receive that and instead you look at any other religion and outside of cults which uh, I'll leave that there um, <laughs> um, and people are on a individual spiritual path really mm-hmm. yeah and I think what like. What if we, what if we were taught in the Christian church to like, Hey, you know what? You go read it and come back and let's have a conversation mm-hmm. about it. Mm-hmm. And we call those small groups or Bible studies, but really <laughs> you're not allowed to say mm-hmm. anything outside of what is acceptable in that room. And I, it's just mind boggling to me. And I feel like when I started really recognizing like the, the feeling and the spirit of like Jesus in my life was when I started asking those hard questions of like, Hey, are you cool with this? And most of the time the answer was, that's not the point. Like right or wrong right here is not the point. The point is I want you to hang with me Mm -hmm. and I want you to recognize all that we created. And I want to recognize how you're connected to other people especially the ones that aren't like you, Mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, I feel like Jesus's mission was to come here and go, eventually all of this connects. And your goal is to open your eyes and open your heart big enough to see people who are, um, uncomfortable for you Mm -hmm. to be with, you know, Mm -hmm. at least that's what I got out of the scriptures, but it's been a minute. Hey, I think it's why we're best friends. (laughs) 
Because <laughs> we're so different or we're uncomfortable with each other? <laughs> we're so uncomfortable that it is like perfect. It's like yin yang. <laughs> I agree. I love it. <laughs> I feel really fortunate that in my life right now, while we're recording the Cat and Moose podcast, that my mother is still alive and kicking and she is awesome. I'm really, really excited to celebrate her this Mother's Day. Stacy, Mother's Day is around the time that this book comes out. So tell us about the date and how you guys arrived on that. Yeah. So the, the book release date is actually May 11th mm -hmm. and and Mother's Day is just the 9th, I think the t Sunday before that Tuesday. Uh -huh. So uh, I, my publisher and I just thought that was a beautiful uh, kind of thematic way to release this book. And, mm -hmm. and you know, my my really my my biggest hope is that it, it finds its way to other parents who are in a similar mm. place and who can can pick it up and. um and really find hope and find a, find a light on a path out of their own questions. And I mean, well, the questions will always be there, but I think just finding a way through yeah. that ends up at this place, like you were talking about Moose, that's a bigger, more expansive, connected place and not this sort of isolated, disconnected, um, which I find, I see a lot of with families, um, like, like, Christian families that have kids that come out. So yeah, we just thought Mother's Day would be a beautiful way to celebrate the the release of this book. So I just want to end this episode by asking you, if you could say anything to Abby now, what would you say? I would say to you, my darling Abby, that um, you have taught me so much, like I said in the book about being brave. I'm I'm continually learning from you um, how to grow my heart and how to be a better mom. Um, and I hope you are patient with me as I do that. And um, I look forward to, honestly, all the years of you flourishing and becoming the beautiful woman that you are. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. If you could say anything about the Cat and Moose podcast, what would you say? <laughs> Just ditto. Ditto what I just said. <laughs> I love it. Okay. I, wait, I need to say this, though, because okay. I'm a really big fan of, of your podcast. And I discovered it, of course, because we have some mutual folks in our life with like family. And it's like Abby and I both listen to this podcast all the time. I, I listen to it on my walks. And I can guarantee you that in my little suburban neighborhood that people <laughs> think I'm out of my mind because I'm <laughs> laughing so hard when I'm out on the street walking. And it has brought so much joy to my life over COVID. You cannot even imagine it. I, I adore you both. And I think I love this podcast podcast so much oh thank you so much we love you too we and we love this podcast too and it's gotten us through COVID. Oh, listen it's the only thing weekly that i did the same every single week i was like <laughs> put on your pants and record the podcast you could do it <laughs> thanks for being on here stacy thank you and we will send everyone your way you guys check out her new book May I send make love? <laughs> make love while you're reading Love Makes Room. <laughs> the book is Love Makes Room and Other Things I Learned When My Daughter Came Out by Stacy Frenis. <laughs> Producer Sarah Reed. To find out more, go to catandmoosepodcast.com. Cat and Moose is a BP production.